And Bill, I'm going to spotlight you. Maybe I'll pin you, it doesn't hurt. And as soon as you're ready, we're ready. So yes, it's been a roller coaster. <laughs> and here we are today. Uh, yeah, definitely, Susan, we're thinking of you. Your comments are always to the point. Appreciated everything you've said. So thank you for your presence through all of this. And we're thinking of you. Um, I'm not going to say as too much this time. I just want to get the ball rolling. Uh, and let me start with a few framing comments. Um, a question we started with back six times, uh, actually 12 weeks ago, if not more, was how do you teach when you're not supposed to talk? And then, of course, the irony comes up that Zen Buddhists talk all the time. And I think the discourse records and encounter, encounter uh, dialogues explain why that happens. Because if we understand how those work, then we can see how you can talk without talking. And that's, that's the paradox. But it's uh, an ingenious, seems to me, uh, development that didn't continue too long as an active practice. Uh, we, we, the, the classic stories all come from the Tang period, mostly. Most of the dialogues are, are 8th, 9th, 10th century dialogues. Uh, and then comments come on through the next uh, four or five centuries, and those get picked up in some of the later collections. So it was a particular style of teaching that was, uh, seems to me very effective. And there's an interesting article by Robert Scharf, who is presently a professor of Buddhist studies at, at UC Berkeley. And the title of the article is How to Think in Koans. How to Think in Koans. How to Think in that Discourse Records. In other words, not what do they say, but how do we think with them? Uh, and that was partly connected to the notion, I think, that others have mentioned, and I, and I mentioned last time, that uh, these are precedent cases. These are skeletons on which, over which are draped the experiences and events of people at later, uh, mass teachers, students at la of later times. Um, I was talking to Bob and, and Joel and a few other people, and uh, uh, music analogies are very useful to some of this. I was talking to a jazz musician recently, a friend of uh, mine, and uh, he said, yeah, Coltrane had a basic form uh, that it was a structure, uh, but once you got very far into what he was doing, you, you kind of lost where the structure was. It was still down there. It was somewhere in there but he was reacting to this basic skeletal form. Uh, and skeleton is an interesting way to, to characterize that because uh, we've talked about function and uh, uh, substance and function. Uh, and they're just two sides of the same coin. Substance is the one truth and the function is the way it manifests itself in phenomenal reality. And the, J Jap the Chinese character for substance can, it's it's a, an ideogram that contains two sub-ideograms. The, the sub-ideogram on the left side is the ideogram for skeleton. Uh, the term actually, the term originally just means body, but the, the ideogram on the left side is skeleton. The ideogram on the right side is a sacred vessel, uh, and that's the body. So it kind of suggests to me, I'm not sure this is the invent, the people who developed this particular ideogram uh, had in mind, but that we have a skeleton in these discourse records. Uh, and the important thing is to see how it works and how one thinks with these. 
uh, discourse records that were so vital to so much of the Zen and Chan tradition for so many uh, centuries. How does it work to think with it? Well, Leighton is very thorough. I wish I'd read him before he translated this. You see, he brings in a lot of commentaries from different teachers, including uh, Suzuki Roshi, which I think is a, a complete shift from what many of the other commentaries had been. So here, 10, 11 centuries later, Suzuki Roshi says, well, here's my, here's my reading of this, and I'll leave it to you to, to, to figure out what he was saying, we'll, or we may come back to that one once we talk about the particular anecdote. But, uh, and, and then of course he, he gives us Dogen's reading of it, and that's different than what other people had said. And then we have his reading of it. And I was working off Professor Yanagida's reading of it. Many of my interpretations were influenced by uh, Yanagida Seizan, uh, who was my teacher in Kyoto. So the question is, how do these work? And uh, one of the things that emerges very early in our study of the Platform Sutra was that uh, practice and principle are united. They're just two sides of the same thing. They're not something separate. Practice is principle seen from a different side. Principle is practice seen from, a from the other side. And so I thought of Marshall McEwen. Uh, the medium is the message. Uh, many of the, the later teachers said sitting straight, breathing, is the, not the end, it's the beginning. And it is the end. It can, it, it's the result of the end. So in our end is our beginning. Or in, the, in our beginning is the end is probably the way to put that start on the sutra. Uh, and so many of the teachings are already available to us in nonverbal form. Uh, and many of these principles that get enunciated in the early period uh, are already there. So uh, if you, th th there are many ways to, there are many different styles of discourse anecdotes. And what I described in my introduction to the, to the review of the last section that we dealt with two weeks ago uh, only represents one. And so I also think of the different styles that could be used in the style of teaching. And, and I, Bob recently sent me a copy of something that Jiro at Jukoji, a passage that he had presented for them to do calligraphy with, which was the purple mountains fade off in the distance. I can't remember the exact line. Um, and it was a commentary on uh, Rinzai. Rinzai's four positions, four practices. That particular poetic line that they copied in their calligraphy uh, session or practiced with was from the four practices. And the four practices of Linji or Rinzai were first, I take away the self and leave the environment. The second one is, then sometimes I take away the environment and leave the self. And the third one was sometimes I take away both environment and self. And the fourth one is, and then sometimes I take away neither. And whether that's progressive or not is never made clear. Uh, but some people have suggested in taking away the self, which is the first of his four, uh, is the kind of beginning position. All that's left is the environment. By removing the self through, let's say, meditation or any other practice, all that's left is the environment. So there are many ways to uh, that these discourse records work. Sometimes it's a straightforward Dharma lecture. What's interesting about Dung Shan is he gives almost none. Rinzai gives five or six fairly extensive Dharma lectures in his collected uh, records. So there's, there's clearly a different style uh, in these two, and clearly between Rinzai and Soto, as you know, if you've read many of the uh, Rinzai records. So 
these are our pedagogic styles that were obviously very effective uh, at a certain time. And uh, I would suggest that no one of these discourse records makes this assertion, or maybe they do. But what I read in this is that the dialogue itself is not an explanation of the Buddha mind, it's a manifestation of the Buddha mind. It's the ability, and Leighton picks up on this as well in the section we're going to deal with today. It's the ability to move freely between the two poles of the pairs that come up again and again, substance and function, form and emptiness. It's the ability not to get trapped in either one of those poles and to move freely back and forth. And then the next day, change your opinion and move back the other way. In other words, it's both of them are present at the same time, which was Linji's final phase. Both this paradox, both components, both poles of the, of the paradox are maintained in one's practice. Now, the other thing that the Platform Sutra seemed to emphasize was it's Zazen in, in when Huinang is talking about meditation and Zazen. He makes a very strong point that it's not limited to the to the cushion. It's walking, it's standing, it's sitting, it's lying down. So I tend to see these discourse encounters as manifestations that take place both on the cushion but off the cushion. And it, it, it was a way of getting out of the separation of silence and, and talking that was evolved through a period of centuries actually into the it height, its height in the 12th and 13th century. This is when it seems to have been most vibrant, this particular system of dialogue. So with that as a background to the, uh, for our two weeks ago, and uh, my second point is that even though the medium is the message. The message is also important, and it's not just the medium. A topic is introduced. And in the case of the sentient beings, not uh, uh, be, sentient, also non sentient beings preaching the Dharma, not just hearing the, manifesting the Dharma, but teaching the Dharma, uh, that w there, there's no argument on that. People at the time, these this discord record was available to them. They already knew that argument, that our discussion, whether it's an argument or not, need not be our concern. Uh, so it was a discussion, it was common. It wasn't common for us. So I was thinking reading Leighton's commentaries. He was talking about Stevie Nicks. You have to be old to know Stevie Nicks. And, and and, and then, of course, Dylan comes in. Now, he, Dylan still has a little more purchase on, on people today, but I'm not sure Stevie Nicks does. Uh, and so a lot of these discourse records are introducing topics that everyone was familiar with at the time. And the point wasn't to repeat that, to bring it back to one's attention. It was to perform with that in a way that showed manifested the non-obstructed nation of the nature of the mind. And uh, linguists call this performative acts, linguistic acts, actions. Often the words we use are actions and not expressions of meaning. So for example, to say, uh, uh, oh, it's not raining today. That's a clear statement of uh, a fact. But if one were to say, Oh, it's not raining today. It means it is raining. And I don't like it. So that's a performative statement. To say when one gets married, I do. Who knows what I do I, as, a me, as, as a statement of fact. Uh, doesn't mean much. But in the context of a marriage ceremony, it means a lot. So it's an action. And that's what I mean by performative when I put that into the explanation. It's a performative action 
the, the dialogues are performative actions that require commentary by later people. Not only require it, they demand it. Uh, they're open discussions. They require people to interact with them. So uh, they were used in Dharma talks by later teachers. Uh, Doug uses them very effectively. I love the fact that he's using Dungshan, but anyway, he's used them several times. Thank you, Doug. Uh, and they're used for Dharma. They, they, they require that kind of engagement. So I would suggest to you, even though this is, this is a way out of the trap that we didn't get to the last chapters, go ahead and read those and use those and, and, and engage in those in your own terms. Because I think once we go through these two that we're talking about now, or these, these two sections that we're talking about today, uh, you'll have the, the basic format and, and the approach that one can take to most of these discourse records. So that said, uh, I also added uh, the comment by uh, Nanyang Hui Chung, the, the, uh, the master who taught non-sending non beings to teach the Dharma. And he gives a little bit of an explanation there and he relates it to the Huayan Sutra, which I think is interesting uh, for two reasons. One, the teachers and the students at this time knew the sutras. The sutras that they're disputing or bringing, they're not disputing, they're bringing them into, into consciousness, were literate. By the Song dynasty, by the 11th and 12th century, it was a requirement for monastics to be literate. You couldn't get your certificate from the government if you didn't show in public monasteries, if you weren't literate. So these people were literate who were engaging in these discussions. They had read these stories and were clearly interacting with them. And uh, so the irony is that in, when, he's, when Hui Chung is asked how he knows this, he quotes a sutra. And this is a teaching outside of words, right? Uh, but he, uses, he brings words in. Of course he does. How can you say anything without bringing words in? So how do you bring in words in without getting obstructed and falling into traps? So that's where we're going. That was the background to today. So now, Pamela, if you could bring up Oh, let me, as you bring that up, let me ask if anyone has any comments or questions on that introductory sheet that I sent out, the first part about the last section. Uh, any, any issues with that? Any questions, any comments? Yeah, I saw a hand somewhere. Yeah. Um... I'm not sure where this, in what you sent with your translation and Leighton's translation, I have a whole bunch of sort of questions about Chinese words and words, but I don't know if that's exactly what you're asking. About. No, no, not right now. In fact, when we read this, right. my contribution will be to uh, say something about the terms and right. let you interpret it from there. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to leave it open at that point. I'll say something about the way it's being, okay, language is being used. No, I'm talking specifically about uh, non-sentient beings teaching the Dharma, and uh, uh, the medium is the message. Uh, mm -hmm. Does that make sense to everybody? Do do you have issues with that? Uh, if so, we could have a Dharma discussion. And if not, let's move on to, and bring it in later if something comes up in terms of those. I'll just, I'll just mention one thing if I can. Uh, yeah, Bob. In terms that you were talking about the framework of how this has been laid out. And it's my, my feeling that education in general is to create a framework of emptiness for the students to inhabit so that if you know that you're the way you've laid this out is that this you're going to have a discussion with words but the the words are empty and you and you have this uh place of emptiness and it's imperative then that the student has to walk into the door you you can frame it but the student has to enter it. 
And that's where, where we come in. That's where the educated people in the past came in. So I want to thank you for uh, you know, making that clear. Yeah, sometimes they talk about going through the gate. And going through the gate is going through the gate of the traditional teaching. It's fairly clear that, that in the Sung Dynasty, uh, when a lot of these, these uh, records were being recorded and talked about in great detail, uh, that the monks had gone through the door. The monastics had gone through the door. They knew the sutras. Uh, and therefore, once they knew them, now you have to deconstruct them. Uh, the, li the life of, I, I love the story of Milarepa, the Tibetan uh, sage, who uh, with his teacher, I think, I forget his teacher's name, I think it was Marpa. Uh, and, and Milarepa uh, was, when he was a student, was told if he really wanted to learn the Dharma, he needed to carry these stones up this very difficult mountain and build a retreat for his, his teacher, who I think was Marpa. So it took him years to do this. He had to carry one stone at a time, uh, a time up to the top and build this hut for his teacher. And finally, when he finished it, he was so proud he'd arrived. He'd done all the hard work. And the teacher said, now deconstruct it, take one stone down at a time. So once he had built up this thoroughgoing uh, or this complete wonderful little meditation hut. He was still now de deconstructed. And that seems to be the pattern in a lot of Chinese in Taoism as well, is to build up a, a, a significant structure of confidence and belief. Now I can do it and say, well, okay, now realize that what you did isn't permanent and you need to deconstruct that. That's, that's stage two. So yeah, you have to go through the door uh, as difficult as some of these sutras seem, I think. And, and sometimes, uh, if you're in the right frame of mind, quite, quite important. Uh, it's an important gate to go through in order to understand how these work. And as Westerners, we come to this with not as much of this background knowledge. And it's only after we've gained a modicum of knowledge of the tradition that these begin to make more sense. So that's part of what the uh, uh, what Leighton is doing for us. He's providing some of the background, and that's incredibly valuable uh, for how these. What, what are the issues? What are the textual issues that were involved? Uh, the sutra issues that were involved in these stories. So yeah, I think there's a responsibility to go back to words, and then deconstruct the words once you get them there. That's what I see as the gate. Thank, thank you. So what we're going to take up today is particularly anecdote number nine, but Leighton uh, in, his in, in chapter two begins by pointing out that there was a discussion that took place be before anecdote nine in number eight, when Dungshan announced that he was leaving and he was going off on his own. So here is the everyday situation or the common monastic practice of the student finally separating from the teacher and going off to find his own place and uh, to begin to teach. And it's clearly that Yunyan has transmitted his teaching to Dongshan. So that's the context. So if you see at the top of the uh, handout, which you received right in the mail, we'll get to the other parts later. The interesting line, when Dungshan had completed his training and was preparing to head off on his own, Yunyan asked, after your departure, will it be hard to meet again? Dungshan replied, it will be hard not to meet. And that's the setup for number eight, uh, number nine, because they, right in the poem, in the verse, we see that that particular point picked up. So let's keep that in mind and take a look line by line, section by section at anecdote nine. I'll make a few comments about what I see that is going on in the language and maybe some of the background and then uh, 
uh, please feel free to introduce your uh, to bring something up and, and and to question what's going on. So it begins with just before departing, Dong Shan asked if after many years, someone should ask if I would be able to portray the master's likeness, how should I respond? Uh, I think Leighton gives some context for this. I give some context in my footnote. Uh, and it's a difficult section, the section that I underlined, portray the master's likeness. It's, it's a difficult use of language at that point. And uh, it uses the term jun, true, shan, appearance, uh, that was to me when I first saw it confusing. Uh, but by going back into some of the older uses of the term, it was clear that what this was was a tradition for students of a particular master who were no longer transmitting the robe of Bodhidharma to each other. That had ceased with the uh, Hui Nung, the sixth ancestor. This was another way of uh, certifying the transmission was that you would be allowed, or uh, I suppose anybody who wanted to, to make a portrait of their teacher could do it, but it, if it was officially allowed, uh, by the teacher, him or herself, then uh, that was a, a way of legitimating the transmission. But of course, what's going on here is something much more important. What is it that's being transmitted? And how do you paint a picture of that? So if you notice in, in Zen monasteries in Japan, and this is true in China as well, there are a lot of portraits of former masters there. Uh, it's a tradition that seems to have carried on well into the, into the modern period of having a picture. Now, remember, there are no cameras and most people haven't seen the people that, that transmitted these teachings. So it would, uh, it, today it's easy to see pictures of anybody and uh, you put it online and the world has it. Uh, right now, all of you are online and many millions of people, will, well, millions are flocking to this discussion, of course, uh, but uh, well, the pictures are available. This wasn't the case then. Uh, so it, it meant something to do uh, in, a, in a kind of official way. But of course, this is just the setup for the dialogue. This leads to a much more important discussion about what is being represented in the transmission. So this is the, the next, uh, that's the story behind doing the likeness or the representation of the master that I, I can contribute to this discussion. Uh, does, does that make sense? Does anyone have any comments on that? Otherwise, we'll go on. It gets more interesting. Because this is where Yun Yen resituates what I call resituates the question. It's not just not just about how do you go about doing this, but what is being represented. So after remaining quiet for a moment. Yun Yen said, and this is a very difficult, three words. It's three words in Chinese, just this person. That's Yanagita, my teacher's translation. Well, actually, that's my translation, just this person. But Yanagita says, in his translation, starts with outside, beyond, meaning beyond, other outside this, the verb am not, or is not, could be either one, is not or am not. So he's outside is, is his this. And this is, there, there are two demonstrative pronouns, as in most languages, this and that. And the first Chinese word, here is zhi, which means the just. 
only. This is the present person, uh, is what's right here at this moment. Not, ooh, look at that. Oh, wait a minute. All right, can you still hear me? Yes, Bill, we can hear you. Okay, I'm, I'm looking at, they want me to uh, upgrade my Adobe Flash Player. So I need to get back to the screen. Let's see if this gets me back there. End of life for Adobe. This happens to me on, a, on various occasions. You can try swiping up with like maybe two or three fingers on the mouse pad and it might show you all your open windows. There we go. Thank you, Pamela, that did it. This is perfect, swiping left. And uh, just there's there's no person mentioned in Yanagita's translation, but Yanagita points out in a, in his reading of an, a text that had just been discovered sometime in the 30s or 40s in the Dunhuang caves that the earliest form of this response was just this person of Han. Han was the dynasty, it meant Chinese. This person, who's, who, this person who's a member of the Chinese people. And it was a formal expression of guilt in a court of law. Just this person of Han. That was changed in the Song dynasty uh, to just this is, or just I am, whichever way you want to take this. That was modified. But again, we come back to the notion that these are public cases, legal cases that are models for the way Buddhists began to talk about uh, their own practice. So, there are just this, not that, it's not something else, it's not something other, is. That's all we have in the, in the record of Dongshan. And of course, Leighton puts the id at the end. The, there's no object in the original sentence. So to make sense of this, he adds that. And he has a, a very useful discussion of why he adds that and also notes that it could mean a number of other things. So he, he's very clear about the fact that that's not the only way to translate this. So as we'll see when we get to the verse, uh, there are many other ways. It, it's, it's interpreted in many different ways, in three or four different ways, not many different ways, three or four different ways. So does anyone have anything they want to add to this or a question about this? Well, I had a question about just Yanagita's um, translation outside this am not. I uh, thought that maybe there was no person in there because he was pointing to this as being a dynamic you know, interaction, thusness. So take the person out because it can't be separated. So the environment, yeah, come the environment takes over then. The, or, then the or that, student teacher. Or that it's all together. Oh yeah. So that that he wasn't, yeah, he was leaving out a a body because the body is not separate from the dynamic exchange going on. Kind of. Uh, just this body. He's not, yeah. Substance. Actually, what the, they'll usually use is substance, and it, it's really the word for body. 
Okay. Substance often equates to the single truth, uh, Bodhi, which is what uh, Nanyang Wei Chung says in his commentary on non-sentient beings. He says, uh, it sits in the place of Bodhi where there's only one thing. It's the one original, which it, perhaps this is where you're going with that. The, to put it all together creates one thing. Yeah, that I was thinking about because we've spent so much time with uh, pairs, I was really thinking of it in a non-dualistic way. So he takes the body, the person, the individual out of the translation, outside this am not. There is no I outside. There is outside this am not. And there is no duality in there because it's merged. It's all merged with the dynamic interaction between the student and the teacher, between them and the environment. So I was just looking at it as a non-dualistic expression. Yeah, I, I, actually that's what I was suggesting with the fact that, that T is not dualistic because it's simply the function, it's simply the substance of function. So it's not, it's just one side of the same thing. But now, incidentally, uh, when you look down at the, the uh, verse, I put in I where it was, we had to put I in, in English to make sense out of, to make a grammatical sentence. Uh, but in Chinese, it's not there. If you see it in parentheses, it's been added by me or Yanagita, or yeah, yeah even Yanagita adds it, and Leighton adds it. But in the original Chinese, I is left out most of the time. So that's not surprising that I is left out. And that's a grammatical thing. The Chinese could say that in normal language. Uh, they could leave I off and you knew it was, the I was speaking at that time. But English makes it hard to, to translate that, that, that way. So this could be a translation issue as well. But it, it leads into some doctrinal issues that we can get to with the verse. So the, yeah, that's it. That's one way to look at that, that I think will show up in the verse actually, what you're talking about, Pamela. Any other responses? Yeah, uh, Anna, Elisa. Um, I, I just have a question about um, the first part of it. Um, before departing, should it, uh, if someone should ask if I would be able to portray the master's likeness, how should I respond? Is he asking, if someone should portray the master's enlightenment uh, or his, you know, his essence uh, rather than a picture or a statue of the master? Is, is that a way to look at it? Absolutely. And I think that's the way Dung Shan looks at it. Mm -hmm. Okay. He, that's really the hidden message. What is it that I'm, what, what is the transmission? And the likeness is not just, it's not the reflection in the water. Right, right. And okay. yet it is. We'll see how it, come, it comes back. In. That's the swinging back and forth between the poles. But I think the question starts with that, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, I think you're right. And so he's taking this traditional as I point out the way these things are set up usually, you ask some question about a conventional monastic practice. I'm leaving and going off on my own now. And it's traditional to have take a portrait of my master. So you start with this very mundane, traditional everyday monastic practice, and immediately flip it into a different area. So one of the things that I thought about when I was translating a, a lot of these, is that the setup is often a lead-in. It's, it's a trap for the master. It's a trap for the student, if the, if the master asks the student. Not so much a trap, it's a challenge. How do you deal with this if you're really being clear about what non-duality is? How do you deal with this, this mundane practice? It's part of the phenomenal world. How do you bring it into what Pamela is talking about is the, the empty or, or even Bob emptiness. 
uh, the non-dual world. And then how do you not get trapped in the non-dual world? You've got to come back into the phenomenal world again. So that, that kind of comes out in the verse a lot. So yeah, at least I think that's that's right. I think that's what he's he's kind of setting up the master to go where he's going with it. And the master comes across. Joel? Uh, yeah, um, briefly, uh, it seems to me maybe Anyan is challenging Dungshan in the first part, after your departure, it will be hard to meet again. I, I, I think Yunnan knows <laughs> the reply and the reply is what maybe he wanted to, to get in the sense that, uh, you know, I mean, the hard to meet again would be mundane world and stuff is you're going to be away, but having, you know, with, he knows he can portray the master's like, likeness. He's transmitted and he's going to go out and teach on his own. So Deng Shan said, naturally, he says it will be hard not to meet because they're always going to be right there in some sense as he conveys the master's teaching. So when you were saying that the challenge, um, I was thinking that that beginning part of the story is Yang Yan challenging Deng Shan. Um, so that's just, that's just that. Yeah, that's, that's kind of the gist of uh, easy encounter dialogue is, is there's always a, a, a barb in there waiting to, to hook you if you get, and, and to learn something from that hook. Yeah, and to verify that this student knows that they can't separate. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next sentence. Uh huh. Dung Shan was lost in thought. Mm -hmm. So finally, Yunyan said, Chia Acharya, having assumed responsibility for this great matter, you must be very cautious. Another translation is thoroughgoing or very careful. And I, I incidentally, as I read my translation, and then I look at Leighton sometimes, say, wow, Leighton got it right. I wish I'd used that word instead of the word I used. And then I think about both of them and I, and I come up with a new one. So this, this, I'm pulling back the curtain on translation. It's a dicey process. <laughs> and don't assume that I've captured what was originally being said in this, in this text. A lot, of, a lot of translation is interpretation. What context do you want to put it in? So don't trust the word, don't trust words, but particularly don't trust the words of the translator. They could be wrong. And they are in many cases. It's, it's a modern world. We're in a different situation. So be very cautious. Lately, I've come up with the thing is thinking of what he was telling Dung Shan to do was to be aware. Uh, it's, it's what Pamela's brought, brought up in some form, form, previous discussions is be aware of what's going on. You've taken this great matter, this transmission, be aware of where you are now and what you're doing all the time. Not just on the cushion. When you're crossing a river, when you're doing other things, when you're washing dishes, whatever. So that would be my recent translation of that, that particular phrase. Be cautious, be careful. To assume responsibility is a legal phrase. To admit, to acknowledge one's uh, uh, transgression. And transgression is used metaphorically here. The transgression is to take issue with standard teaching or something like that, which is not a bad thing. And the great matter was the crime or the transgression in the legal, in legal term. The, the Chinese terms for the great matter are, are very specific and not the standard term for great matter. It's a legal term that became understood as this great matter. So that's just putting it back into the legal context that uh, the Chan Buddhists were using as a form. 
So the next line, Dungshan remained quiet, quietly perplexed. I don't know if I changed it. That was my original one or I changed it. But anyway, I like the notion of being perplexed. But he's just, he's, he's challenged me. Be careful. What does that mean? Be cautious. Be thoroughgoing. I think that was uh, Leighton's translation of that. So we move to the the what I what later commentators call the great pivot, the point at which there's a pivot, a change, something happens. Uh, you see that in Leighton's commentary later on. It's the commentary by another teacher, Hui Chung, his student. Uh, who calls it the jade pivot. It's when a certain thing happens that completely flips the world and fl flips the nature of the conversation. So he was perplexed. And when he was crossing the river, he saw his image reflected in the water and experienced a great awakening. And that's the familiar word, satori. And actually, I would change that translation as well. I like the way Red Pine translates it as understanding. Uh, I can't tell you exactly why I, I, that, because we used to translate that simply as enlightenment. And most of the translations were enlightenment. And this is the only time, by the way, that uh, in Dungshan, he uses this term, Satori, or, or Wu in Chinese. The, the term is Wu. So he experienced an overwhelming understanding, a great understanding of what the previous exchange meant. That's a minor emendation I would make there if I were retranslating that. This was a 40 year old translation, so it's time for a change. So the gata comes, the, the verse. Now, first of all, if you can, you can see this on the screen. The center column are the Chinese terms. First thing I'll point out to you, just in the Chinese terms, and then as we read through it, be aware of these terms. In line one of the verse, it said, earnestly avoid seeking him without. The word, the Chinese word for him is ta, which is the standard everyday word for the third person. And it also is what separates you from wall, which is the first person. So think of that in terms of separation, because he uses a different word for him later on in lines four and lines four, five, and six. Why does he change the word for him? We don't show that in the English. All the English translations don't show that. That was important in Chinese. I, the, the, a Chinese person would see that immediately. There's a shift. When we go to lane, lines uh, four, five, and six, because he's using another word for him, chu. Secondly, notice that you doesn't exist, it, re re it recedes far from you. Uh, so you doesn't occur in either, uh, we, you, uh, Leighton and I use you, but it doesn't occur up here in the Chinese text. Lest it recede far is essentially what the Chinese text says. Recede, and I, I like, uh, I think Leighton's is, is a useful translation because it's a little more explanatory to be estranged from self. He's talking about tel, uh, ta, third person, indefinite third person uh, uh, pronoun. Wo is the first person pronoun, and those two terms separate one from the other. Linguistically, it works, that's in English, it works that way. So it works that way in Chinese as well. So then, as I said, chu is a, is a unique term that doesn't, I had never seen it before it appeared in this context. And when I looked it up in the various dictionaries, uh, it was clearly the, a third person pronoun. So, 
so let's go through the, the, the eight lines and see what we come up with. Bill, can you read that in Chinese first so I get a feel for the, how it flows? I don't have the Chinese in front of me right now. Oh, it's not just these words. Okay. No. Sorry. And, and Bill, were you saying in there that Ta, the first hymn, that that actually describes a space? Is that what I heard? Like it also, I mean, I understand it could be describing him, but did you say it, it describes a relationship that is different than the him, the other him? I think, yeah, I think that's the implication. I don't think it says that. No, that's so I interesting. I think this may be what a Chinese person or a person who's aware of those two terms picks up. So it creates, um, kind of identifies this, space right is what you're saying a chinese person would hear that as identifying or delineating a separation yeah, yeah initially once reaction there's a separation there that is really cool third person and first person yeah but differently than the other way yeah oh yeah well i think that's where he wants to go and i'm uh i'm not a uh, ninth, 10th, or 11th Chinese, I'm wondering what the denotations of Chu are that I'm not aware of. But I suspect it, it stands out, it would stand out as a distinction when one's reading the, uh, uh, the verse. Thank you. Notice that <clears throat> the Chinese does use the word I, and often that doesn't appear. Chinese can very easily drop out the word I, and it's assumed that I is the one making the statement. But here, Dongshan clearly uses the word I, first person. It's in the Chinese wall. Uh, you're asking about Ta again, Pamela. I think Leighton did an interesting thing by making, by othering it, by making that separation. It clarifies that there is a separation rather than just uh, ta, someone right here that I'm with. <clears throat> so lest, lest it recede far from self. Today I am walking alone. And the word for alone is du zi. And du means alone, and zi means self. So the self is alone. There's no companion at that time. Remember in one of the earlier uh, stories, uh, Dungshan is, and Leighton brings this up, Dungshan is asked if, if Ma Zhu will appear for the uh, final uh, a memorial. Uh, he's dead, and there's a memorial being done from him. And Dungshan says he will appear if his companion is here. And so the fact that Dungshan here emphasizes the fact that he's walking alone at this point. This is taking away the environment and leaving the self. I, I, that's my reading of that. You can read it any way you want, but it seems to me that's what he's doing at that point. Line four, everywhere meet him is what the Chinese has. Everywhere meet Chu. This different third person. Chu can mean it, her, him, he, she. Can mean any one of those in English. So there's the translator's perplexity. We have to choose one of those and put it in the translation, but the Chinese know that it could mean. Incidentally, ta and chu are not gendered. It could be she or he, or him or her, or it. All of those work for chu and ta.
So uh, Leighton also makes this clear that it could be him, the uh, Chu, but he chooses to translate it, it as suchness. He, Chu, or it is now no other than me, is now me. I got more elaborate about it. Uh, Leighton very nicely is, he's picking up some of the rhythm of the Chinese by keeping it short and to the point. But I felt obligated to ignore the versity and the prosody and, and to include as much of the original sense of the term as possible. Uh, and he make, clearly says, not other than me. And that's kind of connects with line one, ta, not other than me. But I am not now him. And the Chinese uses the word now. At this moment, I am not now him. Line seven, it must be understood in this way. We're together on that one. And, and Leighton is one, must understand it in this way. Uh, Leighton is, is, I use the passive and Leighton uses the active. And uh, that's, I think that's useful. I think both of those are useful, by the way. In order to merge with or accord with suchness, to merge or accord with suchness, if one understands it in that way. Okay, I'm going to leave it up to you to make sense out of these eight lines. And I think each one of them is, is important. You, you could work through each one of those. Yeah, Joel? Yeah, I'm very interested about the now. It now is me. Uh, I mean, because it's a very different statement uh, than it is me of like, it's more maybe expansive. I mean, each statement includes the other is kind of, I think kind of obvious in a way. Which but one he, is more expansive, no, Joel? Well, the now, because if oh. it's it, like at this moment, I now, am it is different than I am it. Um, like it's more inclusive in a sense without the now, I am utterly it. But I am it at this moment implies within itself the next line. I am not it now. Like, and, and I love the now. Is that now, uh, I don't know. I mean, not that I know what being time is, but it's so evocative. Is his now the being time with Dogen? Um, oh, yeah, go to Dogen, yeah. Yeah, yeah, now, being time. It's both being and time. Uh, I'm sort of bullshitting because I don't know what Dogen means. But it evoked Dogen for me, the use of the time. Uh, what does anyone else pick up with the now? Does that mean any change any of the way you think about this? From Leighton's. I'll, I'll uh, just yeah. uh, I'll jump in. Um, and I know Doug has. Oh, oh, Monica, yes. Yeah. Um, the now seems uh, more dynamic to me. That it's a uh, um, experience of flowing with the the um, nowness and thusness of being instead of solidifying it. And I think that's what Joel was maybe getting at with "I am utterly it," or you know, that seems very static. The now seems much more dynamic and, you know, 
flowing with the constant changing of space and time and thusness and how that is presenting itself in this moment. Yeah. Uh, Doug? Yes. Uh, I'm going to wander a little bit here. Uh, pardon me. <laughs> because I wanted to... Uh, Doug, you're not wandering uh, go back to Okay. Uh, we're wandering together. Yes, um, going back to anecdote eight on after your departure, it'll be hard to meet again, Yun Yen says. And uh, there's a common notion that uh, Zen masters are hard to pin down in where they are, where they're at. And on the one hand, when uh, an accomplished being heads off into the world uh, to spread the Dharma, to meet experience. It's hard to know wherever he will be. And it will be hard to meet again, be, uh, partly in, by the fact that the Dharma needs to be spread and the work is vast. And so to actually meet up again may be tough in physical terms. And Tung Shan's reply uh, that it'll be hard not to meet, of course, brings it back to, it is us, we are not it. Um, the second thing I want to do, uh, tag along is, I really appreciate you enunciating in the anecdote nine about the assumed responsibility. But um, Bill, I wanted to ask first, um, you had some other uh, phrase that, phrases that you use to define the great matter. You said it's a legal term. And there were, seemed to be some, um, I don't know, what were some of the, could you repeat what those terms were for the great matter you used? Uh, it was assuming, in fact, it is, the great matter was the transgression. Uh, the, oh, the, transgression. In, in a court of law. Great. Right. Uh, the, tra the, the transgression. I, I, like, I like that. <laughs> because maybe everything we do are transgressions and felonious. And we better be careful. But when Tung Shan walked over, you know, he's this, this idea of the assumed responsibility of the great matter, you know, he's carrying it with him like, you know, what? Uh, and he sees his reflection. He sees who is carrying this great matter and it hits him. Who is hitting who is carrying this great matter uh, and, and the responsibility and the caution on the breakage in the next step that can happen maybe hits him and he's awakened. And, and it's um, box and lid fit, form and substance merge. And, and it's uh, the words we use are I guess um, <clears throat> the words we use to me are are like uh, residue of the actual experience, and. I just have a, uh, you know, words is so essential, but um, they're only a small part of it. And, and in reading through these words, it's just, I guess, I, I guess what I'm getting from you, Bill, is that it's really important to, to flesh out the experience that's behind the words. And if you don't understand kind of the setup, 
and the experience and the context, it's, it's kind of hard to make out what's, what's next, but it really requires some imagination um, to fill out the, the moment. So uh, back to uh, in recognizing the great responsibility that he carries in being a teacher and he also sees the interconnectedness of himself with all things. Um, and it's um, in, in this moment that you experience it. The now. That's the only place for it. So that's, that's all I'll say. Thank you, Bill. That's very helpful. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I like your focus coming, bringing us back to transgression, to, I, to think about what one is doing when one's teaching constantly as, in a sense, a transgression, because you can't talk about experience. You, this is the, the, the man hanging by his teeth from the branch. If, if, if he answers the truth, why Bodhidharma came from India, he falls to his death. If he doesn't answer, he doesn't convey the Dharma. He doesn't teach. So teaching is required, but it's a transgression. And to understand that it's a transgression is to be able to flow back and forth between the two poles, it seems to me. Yes, it is a transgression, but I do it at the same time. I recognize the impossibility of conveying experience in simple words. It's not now. And the other thing, let me ask this, in the, in the way the dialogue takes place, is that a very now phenomenon? Just this kind of dialogue that swings back and forth. In other words, is it an experience in itself? Does it induce an experience in itself? Should it induce an experience in itself? There's three questions there. Yeah, I have a question to uh, go along with your question. And I've been waiting to find the right time to ask this question. It refers back to the, our previous reading uh, when he speaks about synesthesia. Synesthesia um, being a kind of uh, where the senses kind of uh, cross cross link, yeah. Uh, and he mentions what is it, uh, Dharani? This is, uh, I guess, an ancient practice of uh, chanting uh, in ways that would uh, clarify the body. Uh, that this, uh, I know, there's a Greek uh, ancient Greek precedent for that as well, but. It seems that in the reading of the uh, of this and, and the later ones, especially, uh, but this one as well, there seems to be this uh, uh, it's hard to describe, but uh, so you have the, this very tight structure. I mean, uh, if I could see uh, the, the, the the Chinese um, you can see there'd be a strong architectural form to the structure of this piece. At the same time, it does this, for me, a transgressive thing where, you know, there have been whole uh, religious hierarchies built on the afterlife. And this seems to refute that by saying that, uh, you know, when he says, uh, it now is me, I am not it. That brings it right into this uh, uh, moment. Uh, but one thing that gets me about this is that and this has to do with the synesthesia. Like when Bob was uh, playing the flute and speaking the verse, well, speaking the verse and then playing the flute, uh, it seems like there's, I don't know what you call it, maybe there's a word for it when you when you play an instrument, I, I've heard, I've experienced this with uh, jazz music, 
where the repetition of a certain motif, it sounds like someone is talking. Yeah. So uh, there's an aspect of these verses that uh, it's really kind of confounding. You know, there's there's the words, but there's also this other uh, sense experience of what's going on that it's kind of confounding. But I think that's when you were talking about the dialectic, re, dialectical rhetoric, uh, it's, uh, that's part of its intention, no? That it's not just a, a straight, and, and I, I assume part of the uh, challenges of translation is that with poetry, uh, there's always a song aspect to it. You know, the so, translation of poetry is, is, is a bigger, it's a huge problem in Chinese, for, from Chinese. There's so, well, in any language, I think translating Greek poetry into English probably is, is complicated. But the, uh, the structure of, of both these translations is, it, it shows the strength of the, uh, the original. I mean, the difference between the him and it uh, for me, uh, the it, yeah, seems more expansive, more uh, outside of the realm of just the language, more of, uh, on what I say, a, a synesthesia. Maybe that's the wrong word for it. I don't know what the word is. <laughs> Well, the it was, Leighton is clear about this. He, he relates that to suchness and he's not the only one. Uh, uh, this goes back quite a ways as an interpretation. Many people have tried, uh, understood it as, as suchness, the it. Uh, the suchness of the relationship between teacher and student. The suchness of the relation to the environment that Pamela was talking about, or the, the self separating from, and, and that relationship is a suchness relationship. So it, it's, it's a good place to jump off, to go towards suchness. Yeah, it's, and, and I, I say it's confounding, but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, it's quite real. Um, I'm thinking of uh, the bird's path. I don't mean to get ahead of things, but um, I read the bird's path, and I read it again, and then I read it to my wife. And the second time I read it to her, we both uh, broke down in uh, gales of laughter. <laughs> I don't mean that in a, a derisive way. It was, it was like a key in a lock, just unlock something. So that's what I mean, the synesthesia aspect of it. Uh, I don't know how to, I don't know really how to qualify that, but it's uh, refreshing. Well, I, f I think the fact that they're talking about portraits and images uh, that are not so much seen as heard, in some cases, uh, uh, a portrait, well, but you're seeing it, but you're also hearing some of these things as well. So there's a lot of uh, sense, movement of senses going back and forth. Uh, yeah, there's an aspect to the structure too, where um, I don't know if you years ago I read uh, Freud on the uh, structure of jokes, and uh, you know he said basically there's a repetition and a repetition that builds up, and then at the end you know there's a twist. I have uh, Jewish friends who look at life as a kind of joke that builds up repetition and repetition and at the end there's a, there's a funny twist. <laughs> uh, and I get that in some of these, um, uh, particularly that, that, as I mentioned, the bird's path uh, had that twist on the end. I've been requested to ring the bell, so I will. Okay. Doesn't that mean we're just beginning? Yes. <laughs>
No, well, that I guess gives everybody an opportunity who needs to leave um, to think about that. But I hope we can just continue a little bit longer because I have a hand up, Monica has a hand up, and we also want to take a few minutes at the end to just kind of have a kind of an online closing circle about this incredible experience we've shared. So I don't know who asked you to ring the bell, but I did not. That was not I. That was from earlier in the day when I said. <laughs> oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I see. It, it was you, but it was at 9, 11 a.m. <laughs> yes. I was trying to get a little bit more time then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't see it then. I mean, I just okay. did so it. So here we are. <laughs> Thanks. Sure. Tim, were you done? Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Can I jump in just uh, quickly? Um, I, I have a couple um, comments, questions. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Um, the first one is just on the question of translation itself. And maybe this is a, a longer answer than, but um, I re remember reading a book um, years ago called The Geography of Thought. And it was about how the structure of language affects how we relate to the world and different cultures have different approaches including you know and bill please correct me if i'm wrong because i'm just trying to remember what i read but like chinese and japanese are structured more relationally so that a, a noun can have different meanings based on how how it's structured in a sentence or in relationship to other things, whereas our language is, you know, kind of constrained by the subject object duality in, in, um, in the way we structure our language and writing. And I was wondering for you, um, I mean, as we've just seen in our conversation, one character can mean vastly different things based on the other characters in the um, in the sentence or um, in relationship to how it's being used. Um, and that can, you know, so we have these gatas, we have these stories, we have these things that are coming to us from China and Japan that are have built into them these multiple layers of meaning. And we're trying to take that and translate it into our Western language, which is subject object. And it's almost um, necessitates us choosing one of those interpretations over others. And that seems to um, leave a lot out and also kind of forces us to um, if we really want to dive into the teachings, we have to kind of take it upon ourselves to explore um, the multiple meanings there. Whereas like, like you were saying with one, one character can mean so many things. It's right there on the page. And we are, you know, to, in order to really engage with the teachings, we sort of have to do extra credit homework, you know, to kind of dive in a little bit more deeply. Um, so I'm, that's one thing, and I know that's a big thing, and I just want to say that and get your response. And the other thing is just a comment that I find delightful that both your, your explanation of the kind of the legal formal language of just this person of Han and the great matter are um, very humbling. It's saying the great transgression and just this person is a expression of guilt. So it's like, you know, there's this transgression and yes, I'm guilty of this transgression. And it's kind of a, a twist on the teacher student relationship in that it's a humbling position and saying, yes, I'm guilty and, and of this great matter. It's not elevating the expression to, I know more than you, you know, I am more important or whatever. So I find that really, that kind of play with the words really delightful. So I'll just end there, but I, I'd like your, you, just your comments or your experience with that, with the link translation um, problem. 
conundrum. So. Well, okay, you, you said you need to do extra credit. So the next uh, seminar will be Chinese language. We'll study Chinese language for a while. So you can, <laughs> no, that's an exaggeration. Uh, it's a problem the Chinese had when the, the, Buddha, the Sanskrit text came into China. And that's, that's why I think Chinese Buddhism is clearly Chinese. Uh, even though it roots, it has deep roots in India, there's, there's no doubt about that. But it becomes very Chinese because they had a language that is radically different from Sanskrit. And translating Sanskrit was an incredible problem for them. And they, they adopted a lot of native categories uh, in order to translate what were non-native concepts coming from, from India. So we're, gonna, we're doing the same thing. And I think that's the nature of suchness. Uh, we exist in a different space and time. And we, we're forced to, try to, to come up with terms for these things. It's hanging, I'm hanging, I'm transgressing every time I translate a line of, of Chinese because I'm hanging from this branch and opening my mouth and saying, this is what it says. Now, I'll tell you I'm right most of the time, but never mind. Uh, I think a lot of what we, we have to accept the, humbly that what we're doing in commenting on these or translating is that it's, it's, well, first of all, that it's a humbling experience to know that when I was translating this, I began to feel guilty. I knew that I was making decisions that weren't necessarily the only way to decide those things. And they, look, this is gonna be printed. People are gonna be reading this. I've got this incredible burden of guilt on my back right now. I, I put that out there. And so, incidentally, so I welcome this opportunity to confess my guilt in this great matter uh, with people who've now read my translation. I've never been able to do that before. But anyway, uh, thank you for that. But it's a useful problem. It's a constructive problem. And I like... Uh, when, when we were talking recently about host and guest, well, I can't remember when that was, uh, but we're talking now about teacher and student. And I think you could read this entire uh, verse as a commentary on teacher and student. Suzuki Roshi says, uh, 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 yeah, Suzuki Roshi says, it's a comment on self, the object is self. I see myself. Uh, and he goes, he takes off on that tangent. So there are all these different ways to read the poem. But I think if, I think we're condemned to interpret. And that's our, 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 our that's reality, that's suchness. Uh, thank you, Monica, that was, that was helpful. Uh, Pamela? Uh, yes, I am just, finding these little threads that you've dropped on the path crumbs today and picking each one up and ingesting it and finding them quite delicious. So I wanna say that first, but I'm noticing in this particular gatha that it follows in some way the Rinzai pattern you talked about earlier, although maybe not in that order, but it definitely follows it. And I thought that was pretty interesting, you know, that the self is present then it's absent then the environment's present and then it's absent and then they're both gone and then it's all back together so i think that's interesting the other thing that really strikes me is these two lines remind me so much of um um uh, the one the other suture that i really love the host within the host um um jewel mirror awareness it reminds me so much these two lines um, he is now no other than me, but I am not now him. It's just like you are not it. It is actually you, member. And it strikes me that it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a encouragement, I think, maybe, is the way I would say it, um, or foreshadowing of encouragement, that we can actually have this with us all the time, you know? that 
there's this, I don't know, for me, this little sense that, especially when you read the, the, the thing about the grasses and the obstructions, that, you know, we can both exist in this place where we are merged with suchness with all the grasses and obstructions as well. You know, that it's all together now, as the Beatles would say. And by the way, Leighton also mentioned Joni Mitchell. Just got to get that in there. <laughs> so very much time and space. So anyway, I really appreciate all of these threads. And I know that there's a relationship. It must be, this is the beginning of jewel mirror awareness. This is like its birthplace, right? Because it's right there, at least for me, it's screaming at me. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Looking forward, I, Bill suggested that we, our next one is on learning the Chinese language, but piggybacking on Monica, if you really want to learn how something is translated from the Japanese, we have to learn Japanese to, to pick those words apart and all the obvious differences. But then you have to go from the Japanese back to learning the Chinese to learn what the Chan were doing. And then you have to, as Bill said, we have to go back to the Sanskrit. And and I just, I'm feeling like I'm running out of time, uh, how much uh, I, I have left on this earth, at least in this uh, time. And so I'm just going to pick and, and choose somebody that I like. And Bill's one that I like his translation. So I'm going to say, I'm going to accept what you've said and and use it how I see fit. So thank you again, Bill. I have to say when I got to graduate school and they told me, I said, I'm here to study Chinese. That's my field. I'm here to study Chinese. And my advisor said, well, okay, start with Sanskrit. And uh, after you've done that, and this is, I'm in my late twenties at this point, start with Sanskrit, are you kidding? Uh, and then go on to uh, uh, continue your Chinese. I'd already done Chinese for a while. And then realizing that so many of the commentaries are in Japanese. And I was going to Japan to work with the Anagita. So then they said, learn Japanese. And I was in my thirties. I said, I didn't have time then. I don't have time for all this uh, in my thirties. So I sympathize with you. I even feel it more now <laughs> than before. Thank you. I, I, you don't have to learn Chinese. I think there's uh, enough grist. I, yeah, you can thank me for that later. You don't have to learn Chinese. I'm being generous. Uh, but I, I don't, I think with an understanding of how these worked, these, these, you look at the different interpretations throughout history through a thousand years of history of these stories. And you see how differently people read them, but they're all getting close to something that they share in common, I think. I sense it there, but I can't put my finger on it. But it's, it's a mode of teaching and learning that I find very helpful. It's not simply straightforward explanations of what truth is. It's, it, the only way it's gonna happen is when you experience it. And part of me engaging in this dialogue whether it's in English or Japanese or Chinese. It's the way you engage with the dialogue, it seems to me, that leads to the experience. And by the way, you're the one to talk about uh, synesthesia. And the, what always occurred to me when you play the shakuhachi now is that I hear the, 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 uh, the four vows in, in just in the music when you just do the music. So there's sound carrying a different uh, understanding of this because I put them together. I've experienced putting them together, not because it automatically happens to me. So that's what will happen with our English understandings of, of these things as well. So despair not, just feel guilty. So as you see, there's so much left to talk about in these things or just to, to keep going back to. I think it's not something just to study, it's something to actually engage in, to perform. Uh, and uh, 
perform, I don't mean perform in the, in the superficial sense, but to actually do this in dialogue, not just sitting on the cushion, but engaging actively. And that's one of the things I think Leighton said, I really liked about Leighton's later commentary about how dynamic this is and how you have to be, it's, it's not, even though we're using words, it's not the words that are, that per se, that are it, it's the way you use the words and are able to flow uh, within the words and not get hooked up. There's the main, main transgression, I think, is that one get hooks, gets hooked up to emptiness and say, that's it, that's the meaning, or to particular, that's it. Uh, as soon as you're, you're stuck in any one of those, I think you're stuck. And that's what Wei Nang said. You're, you're estranged. He says that, I forget in which passage, but anyway, it goes all the way back to Wei Nang and even earlier, I'm sure. So I will leave it at that. And if anyone wants a capping phrase on this, please go ahead, but I'm, I'm out. I was just thinking that you could have a tattoo that says, know this, know that. <laughs> Um, I hope everyone can take just a couple more minutes and hang out. And, um, you know, at the end of a session, we have a little closing circle and go around and express our experience and just, just maybe a sentence or two because we're running late. If everyone who's left would like to do that, and I will start by saying ah, deep, deep bows, Bill, just incredible teaching. And I so appreciate your effort and your loving attention to every word and teaching us. It's just such an incredible privilege, really, to sit at your feet. I know you're embarrassed by this, but really, it is such a gift. And I am forever grateful. I mean, you really are the person. I experienced all those sutras for years before I met you. And then you were the person who let me unwrap them differently and I'm just forever grateful to you so thank you I want to just follow on that and just echo what Pamela is saying thank you thank you and I and I just want to circle back to something that you said earlier because I feel like that's kind of embodying this whole group is like the these exchanges are now they're an experience in the present moment, and that's what we're having together here. And and that that this has helped it come to life for me in a way of it's just it's not some message coming from the past, you know, through the through time. It's something that's happening right now too. So thank you. And I need to sign off. So thanks to everyone too. Bye bye. Thank you, Mother. Yeah, th I just wanted to say, Bill, thanks uh, for being such a great guide. Uh, you know, th these texts were would have been opaque, you know, for me to approach them on my own. And speaking of uh, student and teacher, you know, you um, were a great guide and opened this up for me, so that I feel like I could go and read these books on my own now. Uh, I was trying to remember the number of the uh, piece that was on our reading today, where he, uh, the student says uh, something to the effect that it was like he had found a, a pearl amongst the shit. <laughs> so, thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, hello. <laughs> I can't get the, I'm on my iPhone. I, I don't usually use it for this process, so I don't have my laptop. So I can't see everyone at once, but I, I have just speaker view here. Um, but I'm very touched to see everyone and to hear the, the final class. Um, and uh, I'm doing well, and I'm going to find out if I can get out of here today. So... This was really impactful and meaningful, um, brought so much together for me of 
uh, lifelong experiences. And I'm really thankful that we've had the opportunity to be together with you, Bill. And I won't uh, ask you to um, let go of the limb any further <laughs> uh, because you do it in your being all the time. So, uh, and then Pamela, I don't know what the process will be because I can't see everybody now. So how, how are we doing in our circle at this point? Well, one thing I wanted to do, I'm glad you're still here, Toba, is Thank you. that um, the board of Santa Barbara Zen Center, and I know that other people want to speak, but while I still have Toba on the line, um, the board wants to make a gift to you, Bill. And um, it's sitting behind me. <laughs> and, and Tova, I had to go to Tova's house yesterday to get it because she was going to make this presentation. And because she pulled it together for us. So Tova, would you like to speak to this while I unveil it? <laughs> Can we do it? Oh, uh, I, I will uh, hope to speak here. Okay, here um, we go. There is something. Right. Right behind me, and I will show it to you. <laughs> so, uh, I have to I have to put this back into Pamela's lap because she decided that it was it was important to give you a tree. So we went round and round to figure out this is actually a tree. Everybody, this is um, Sambucus. This is an elderberry tree bush and it's because you are our elder that we finally decided on this one and it took a little finding to get this particular um, but I hope that you uh, have a place where this might grace your life and that um, it will help you see how it bears fruit for all of us and it is it does go dormant which is an interesting way to be and not be and I don't know what it's going to do on your side of the mountain. So it's, uh, it's an honor to be able to present this way. <laughs> Thank you. I, I have a, an elderberry up in the cabin in the mountains that's been there for 10 years. And it's, it's wonderful how it's rooted out and expanded and spread uh, all over the place. And it has these wonderful elderberries in, in the season. Uh, and I haven't made wine out of them yet. Uh, I just <laughs> enjoy the, uh, the berries. So I'm very happy to be an elder. Uh, and it's, we got you an elderberry, not only because you're an elder, but also because you're a berry, because <laughs> you're a <laughs> sweetheart. And the teachings are sweet as well. So thank you, Bill. I just want to add here, Bill, thank you so much. Many, many warm, deep bows, dear friend. I am really pleased with the selection of the tree because not just of uh, the tree analogy, but the whole six weeks and all the work Bill has put in, the there's an old saying that Bill is the type of person who plants a tree under whose shade he shall never sit. Uh. And you have spread the, your shade over all of us. And I think it's, it's going to bear fruit. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, I do have to say, you had me at John Coltrane. <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm, I'm still there. But what I'm realizing is every day I practice scales, and octaves. I don't like practicing scales and octaves, but I have to so that when I perform, it comes out properly. And I realize I don't like these book studies. I don't want to read any more books, but I have to if I'm going to understand emptiness, if I'm going to walk through that framework and the door that you've presented to us then I have to do that. And thank you for forcing me, but I do appreciate it, but I don't like it. <laughs> it hurts me more than it hurts you, Bob. <laughs> uh. 
Bill, thank you so much. <clears throat> I know so many years and, and uh, energy levels have gone into this presentation. It's, it's really wonderful. And speaking of shade, I wanna thank Pamela for recording everything so that we can once again go into the shade and, and experience that and maybe have uh, deeper understandings. Mm -hmm. but, um, my deep, deep gratitude. Thank you. You know, I like the image of the tree because the other idea of that was that the roots reach out and connect with each other underground, right? And the trees come together. And I think that's part of what uh, sessions like this do, whatever we're talking about. The, the roots are still growing underneath that are, are connecting us in an important way, I think. Well, those of us who are left, can we do the vows together? Just since we're closing, I'll give a bell. And Bill, do you want to chant them? Okay. <clears throat> Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. The, dharma, the desires are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to master them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. Shujo muhan se gando mono mujin se gandam. Omun Muryo Se Gangaku Mutsuro Mujo Se Ganjo Sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Desires are inexhaustible. I vow to put an end to them. The dharmas are boundless. I vow to master them. The Buddha way is unsurpassable. I vow to attain it. 